Bodada, um, my name's Rachel. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I um, co lead Lighthouse Church along with my husband and a fantastic team. So, I know we did Rachel um, doing kid in our kid are way with Emma and Kapal Galede. Um, and I've got three boys, which is lots of fun. I'm following on from Alan last week, who has been just starting this journey about getting us thinking about seasons and how life is a journey and we've, we've, we find ourselves in all sorts of different seasons. and one of the wonderful things about living in a rural area is you n- often know your community quite well. You know, our schools are, are smaller, our churches are smaller. There's a more intimacy, isn't there, when living on an Morn. And so I know just even looking around this room, there are lots of seasons going on and represented in this room, whether that's going through bereavement, whether it's making decisions about work and childcare and w- homes and making decisions about health and what road to go down with that uh, all sorts of decisions and seasons just represented in this room and I just thought it was wonderful last week the way that um, just seeing people some people it was if you were here last week Alan at the end got us to respond in, in different ways depending on kind of what season of life we most connected with so I know some of you were in a season of apathy and it was going to look in the mirror and asking God to speak to you about what he wants to say about you and to you in this season for some of you it was so powerful on your knees just at the cross just in a season of challenge where life is just hard and actually sometimes all we can do is just kneel and worship and pray and um, it was just wonderful and I kind of remember standing by Leslie Percival being like I feel like I should be doing something but also I feel like I shouldn't because people are just God's just ministering to people without any intervention which is just wonderful and then for some of you it was blowing bubbles over there in a season of celebration um, a season of joy a season of gratitude but I think one of the most important things that connects kind of all three of those whatever season of life we're in the way we were responding last week was to connect it was whatever season we're in it was a a longing, a helping us to connect with God, to connect with his love, to connect with his mercy, to connect with his joy and righteousness. It was that connection to God, whether it's on your knees or whether it's in celebration, whether it's having to look at yourself in the mirror, it was trying to find a way to connect. Jesus says just time and time again in the New Testament, and we see kind of God's message time and time again throughout scripture is come to me you know what Jesus says doesn't he come to me all who are weary and heavy burdened this sense of come and connect with me doesn't matter what season you're in doesn't matter what you're carrying come to me come and connect with me or you know for Moses you know God's relationship with him is like come and connect with me up on Mount Sinai come come up come and join me come and be with me I've got things I want to show you But it was an invitation. Moses had to walk up the mountain to go be with God. We looked at that scripture that the kids taught us a few weeks ago that they learned on family camp, didn't we, from Revelation, that Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I'll share a meal together as friends. Jesus is asking for us to come to him for connection no matter what's going on on the other side of the door whether we're coming to the door and we're like the house is clean and tidy you're feeling on top of the world you've done your makeup you dress nicely and you're like hey Jesus come on in let's celebrate let's hang out things are going great sometimes it might be you're going to that front door and the house is an utter tip life is on top of you you're still in your pajamas you look an utter mess you really don't want to open that door you don't want anyone to come in and see what's going on but Jesus said if you open the door to me doesn't force his way in this is a God who invites us for connection come near to God and he will come near to you it says in the book of James But it's that sense of coming near to God. We have to make that step, that step of faith to come near to him, to choose that posture of connection. 
I love that um, when Jesus is getting really frustrated with the religious um, Pharisees in Matthew. And he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. That's God's heart for his people, for his children. Connection, that gathering in to engage with him. And so often, for all sorts of different reasons, we choose not to connect. We choose to disengage. Our posture is one of turning away. So are we postured towards connection with God? Because life is hard, isn't it? Sometimes life is really hard. And where do we go to? Where do we turn to? Who do we turn to? Just got a few questions here that I'd love actually just for us to spend a few minutes to just discuss, and you can share as honestly, you know, you can, what surface answers is fine, but just start us to think. So just a few minutes, discuss on your tables or if you sat on the back row, what's your response? When life gets hard, what are some of your default reactions of where do you go to, who do you go to? So, um... Here's a, just a list and some thoughts I made around where I think often we go to. Um, so, gwaith. I read when I just mean that gwaith, and I focus on work areas. You know, when there's areas of your life you can't control, I'll often go to, I'll go more extreme in areas that I can. So, that works for me either in work or with children. So, I've noticed I'll try and over control my kids. I read when I just then in Tori Loud, we physically break down when life's really hard. Yeah, we focus, like I said, at most of the vain in real life, the areas within our control. I think for a lot of us, uh, materialism, like when life is hard, what do we do? We, we buy stuff. I think that's a really common kind of reaction in our culture. Uh, Amazon's awful, isn't it? You know, you, that literal one swipe, and you've got something arriving the next day. But it does just make, it eases the pain a bit for that kind of short term. Like more power, we seek after more power or more knowledge because it's like a security blanket when life's hard. If I try and get more influence or if I try and learn more stuff, I think that it'll be okay. Ire bobble then he just in the mossod, we just attack, whether that's physically, emotionally. I think for some of us, we just disengage. I know for me, I, that can be a bit of a tendency. For me, I can be physically present, but emotionally I've disengaged. And that's a challenge for me. Like, so particularly in relationships that are very close to me, I can like keep going <laughs> on faith, but actually I've disengaged from that person. I've not, I've not had the conversation with them to say, actually, there's a bit of a barrier between us at the moment. Because it's hard and it's risky, isn't it? You don't know what the outcome of that conversation is going to be. Me and Al have had that recently this year, having to go there and have those conversations with each other where you're like, you're actually driving me nuts at the moment and this is why. And then you've got to hear, well, actually, you're driving me nuts at the moment and this is why. And you've got to be quite vulnerable to be able to hear that stuff, to have the courage to say those things, not knowing how they're going to respond, how it's going to make you look. There's a lot of risk and vulnerability involved. I think a lot of us hide, then in Kidia, then he just in Kidia, or Bowed. We just uh, we stop answering messages, we don't pick up the phone, we just hide from the world. I think for some of us, we just try and numb the pain, we try and forget it, whether that's in physical ways, we just use drink to just take the edge off the pain, maybe turn to drugs to just help us kind of numb that. And I think for some of us, it's just denial as well. Just pretend, we just pretend everything's okay. And I think for a certain amount of time, we can keep on going like that, but not certainly not forever. And that's certainly not what God wants for us. That's certainly not, I don't think, what God's best for us. I want to just share this as a bit of a signpost. Um, I'm going to send this to small group leaders, the next slide. Um, Brené Brown, anyone heard of her? An American uh, researcher, she re- researches a lot of stuff around uh, vulnerability. Um, but her recent book is called Atlas of the Heart. And this I just thought was really interesting, would be interesting to look at in small groups, one to one discipleship. You can't see it that well, so I'll send it, and they'll be printed off for small groups this week. But it's where do you go to? And she puts like a list of emotions. So, for example, like, 
places we go when we fall short. Where do you naturally go? Do you go to shame? Do you go to self-compassion? Do you go to perfectionism? Do you go to guilt? Do you go to humiliation? Do you go to embarrassment? What do we do when we fall short? Or when, when places we go, when it's beyond us. So when life feels too much, there's so much going on in the world that we don't really understand. How do we process that? Where do we go? Do we go in awe and like, wow, isn't this world amazing and complicated? And I don't understand it, but that's okay. Do we go in wonder? Do we go in confusion, curiosity, interest, surprise? How do we approach and react to these things? Because actually, the seasons we're in, our circumstances can so often end up defining us. And they can define us for good or for worse. And I'm sure you've all come across people that you can tell there's been, a, there's been a, something that's happened in their life that has defined them so much that it's changed who they were. I know for me, someone um, who I know is close to me... I, after her divorce, she became a completely different person, completely bitter, never could let go, hated men, full stop, really. That, you know, that circumstance, that pain, that season that she was in, ended up defining her for the rest of her life, the way she approached the world. And, um, and I think, you know, we all carry, each and every one of us, we might not have physical scars, but we have scars and wounds from the seasons that we've been through. I love um, on the next slide, I think. So trees, I, this is so interesting, I think. You can tell, you know how you can tell from how many rings in a tree, how, kind of how old it is, you can figure out its age. But you can also, it can also tells you the seasons it's been through based on the lines. So you can't read that very well. But you see where the lines are more spread out, they're wider. So... That's showing like good weather. Those are the years of good weather. So some harada, it's kind of good wide spaces. The tree grew healthily. Can you see where the rings are really like close together? So you can look back and say, okay, that must have been, those must have been years of drought. So those are difficult seasons in the life of that tree. And then, does anyone know what this is? The tree was hurt, yeah. Anyone think why? Fire, yeah. Yeah. So it's the year of a forest fire. And you'll see it's, it's got a wound. Trees have wounds. Which I was like, oh, wow. That, like, just like humans, they carry runes of when they've been burnt. And um, I don't know what you, wounds you've got. You might have some physical wounds. I've got like a little stretch mark here after this that is always going to be with me now. <laughs> Darn it. Um, and I've got like a weakness in my thumb. You know when you crack a nail, it always grows with that weakness. So like every month it'll break and I have to like cut it because it, it's really annoying, but just part of it will always be there, that weakness in the nail. And so, how you know, just like trees and their lines there, they tell a story of what seasons they were in. How do we choose to be defined by the seasons that we go through? How do we allow God to take our whole lives, our brokenness, our wounds, and turn it into something beautiful for his glory? How do we posture ourselves towards connection with him and allow him to move us, to shape us? to mold us? How do we lay down our whole life? I don't know if you've come across the, um, the type of artwork called Kintsuki art, where they take broken pottery and they turn it into something beautiful by putting gold through it. And um, I think that's so beautiful because we will know, going through life, there will be times things will break us, they will hurt us, they will harm us, they will burn us. And yet, if we are obedient to God and posture ourselves towards connection with him, his grace, his love means it can turn us into something beautiful. We always have a choice when we go through difficult seasons, how we choose to perceive the world around us. You know, like what glasses do we put on to view the world around us? I do really believe we can either, when we go through difficult seasons, we can either let our pain shape our image of God. We can allow our pain, our circumstances to shape our image of God and our belief of who he is. This pain happened to me, therefore God doesn't care. This happened to me, therefore God isn't present. This pain happened to me, therefore God must hate me. God is punishing me. God is angry with me. This happened, therefore God isn't real. That's what happens when we allow our pain to shape our image of God. 
And I really believe God calls us to do it the other way around, through faith. God is good, therefore I will lean into that love, even though my heart is breaking. Madhuan Fudlon, God is faithful, therefore I'll choose to hold on, to persevere even though I don't understand why. Madhuan Hari, God loves me, therefore I'll draw close to him, even though I'm scared and anxious. Which way do we do it? Do we allow our pain to define, define our image of God? Or do we allow the image of God to shape our pain? I think in seasons of real, when they're hard, these scriptures and worship, they can be our tools. They can be our weapons. You know, verses like 1 John 4, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This isn't love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You know, scriptures like that, or John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. What if every time we went through difficult seasons, we choose to posture ourselves towards connection, we choose to start from that place and allow that to speak into our pain. What beliefs we choose to partner with have a huge impact on how we journey through seasons. And often, I don't know if you're like this, Alan is so funny. He gets halfway through summer and he's bored and ready for the next season. (laughs) So I'm ready for autumn now. And I'm like, no, I don't want summer to end. And he'll get through halfway through autumn. He's like, okay, I'm ready for winter now. And then, you know, half through winter, I'm ready to move on now and bring on spring. (laughs) And, um... And often we want to rush the seasons we're in, don't we? I think even more so this day and age. We're always right on to the next thing, always on to the next thing, particularly when it's a difficult season. But I think God's always like, what is he wanting to show us? What's he wanting to teach us in that season? What's he growing in you in the season that you're in? I think um, this is why, uh, you know, one of our, um, one of our three main values here at Kappa Galadi is discipleship, discub life that longing to grow, longing to become more like Christ, choosing to posture ourselves towards growth and learning to be more like him. And so, you know, through whatever season, how do we connect with God? How do we connect with his word? How do we connect into small groups? Or how do we connect into the gathered church when we're in pain, when everything in us wants to hide? How do we connect with like people that will help just disciple us? when we're feeling broken. Just a few thoughts really on discipleship, just, just gonna throw those out there of why I think it's just so helpful if we choose to posture ourselves towards growing. So these are just areas that I think just really help us as we choose to posture ourselves towards growth and pushing into who God is, pushing into his word, pushing into his body. I think we see greater self-awareness and more hinain and we both yaith. When we allow God to shape our narrative more, we see more of our blind spots. I think the Holy Spirit has this amazing way of just bringing stuff to light that maybe we've not seen before. That pain and fear is processed. Poor in our and Kali processi. And we choose to posture ourselves towards connection with God. A kameriad and Kali, that's blegis, a character being developed. I think we see deliberate growth in people. Tuv boriato. Vopachot and Kali kefesi. You know, we start, you know, when we start owning our stuff, taking responsibility for some of the stuff that's in us that's not good. We confess those sins. We start making decisions. You know, we're not paralyzed by fear. We feel more confident to make um, decisions. I think we see more commitment to church and the body of Christ. Sometimes the body of Christ can feel like a scary place, can't it? When you're in a place of brokenness and you feel like, oh, everyone else is fine. I don't know. How do I worship when I, I don't know if I can? My heart's not there. Well, how do I engage with people when I don't have the energy? But choosing to posture ourselves towards connection. I think God's timing is different from ours. There are things we don't understand that we're not in control. And I love that Ecclesiastes, um, if we're going on from what Alan was reading last week in um, chapter 3, in verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. And he's also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So how do we posture ourselves towards connection? 
But what I'd love us to do, th- I mean, there's loads in these questions. So again, these I'm going to send to small group leaders to kind of unpack a little bit more. But the first question is just really like a self-check. Like, how is my connection with God at the moment? Maybe ask this of yourself, you know, how's my connection with my friends at the moment? You know, I ask that regularly about me and my sister. She lives all the way in Bath and I'm always like, how's my connection with her at the moment? Am I feeling close? Have we spoken recently? Have we kind of drifted a bit because life's just got busy? Same with our relationship with God, isn't it? Like, how is my connection with God? What's my main posture of worship in this season? What posture would best help my connection with God? So a whole load of kind of like discipleship questions that would be great to unpack more um, in small groups, in discipleship. But I thought, um, we're coming to the end, but I'd love to finish with was that um, prayer that you prayed, um, Jan, around the actual physical postures. I thought that was so good and just what a brilliant way to end. So if you're able, do you want to just respond with me and just stand with me? So posture prayer of surrender. We confess our natural posture is to defend ourselves, to fight for our rights, to make something happen. But we choose as a disciple, we choose as, a, as disciples, Jesus, a posture of surrender. Jesus, you be in charge, you have our lives, you take control. We confess our natural posture is to take control to keep, to hold. But we choose as disciples of Jesus to open our hands and let go. Freely we receive. We take a moment to receive what we need for today. We choose to keep our hands open so that everything we receive, we give. We confess our natural posture is to speculate to critique, to judge, to say, it's not my problem. But we choose as disciples of Jesus to open up our lives in a posture of engagement. Say to the poor, to the orphans, to the despairing, to those on the margins, come, the kingdom of God is here. Amen.